It does not depend on who you are, what you are, what you've done, what you will do, how you're going to live your life, any of these things. There is not one qualifying factor about you whatsoever. There is nothing about you, has nothing to do with you. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on what? But on God who has mercy. How can God be totally sovereign or totally in control? And why are we held responsible or accountable for his actions and his decisions? That's the paradox we're addressing today. And the reason why this is probably, I have two little points to share here. One of the things, the reason why this is one of the most difficult subjects that we're going to cover is because at the end of this lesson today, we are not going to actually come out with an answer. We're not going to come out with an actual answer. And the reason why is because you, you kind of can't. These are two things that run in parallel with each other. They're two things that are certainly all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to, Re Genesis to Revelation. They're two things that are absolutely real. And yet, if we try to figure out the full connection between the two, the thing that tends to happen is we, e we diminish one and promote the other, right? So either we diminish God's sovereignty and we exalt our responsibility, or we exalt God's sovereignty and we diminish our responsibility, meaning we have no free will, right? But neither of those are true. Both of these run parallel with each other. They're parallel truths. They go with each other. And we're going to explore what that looks like and how we can be okay with not really totally understanding it, but understanding who God is in the midst of it. And the second part is that when it comes to design, divine sovereignty and human responsibility, there's multiple facets of this. The facet that we're going to cover today revolves around salvation. And the reason why is because I believe that salvation is kind of the biggest of the divine sovereignty things, meaning it kind of has the most riding on it. Either you're saved or you're not saved. There's a lot more to that than like, did God have me struggle with the sin or not struggle with it, right? Salvation is the thing that we're covering, but it encompasses a wide range of things. So, divine sovereignty, human accountability. Where do we find this in Scripture? Well, it turns out that this is all over Scripture. Like I said, from Genesis to Revelation, for instance, Pharaoh. We're going to talk about Pharaoh a little more in depth here in a little bit. We also have Matthew chapter 11, 27 through 28. This says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Sovereignty. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. God's sovereignty. God is the one choosing to reveal himself to people. Then verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, your accountability, your responsibility. God is sovereign in showing himself to who he shows himself to, but you are responsible for coming to him. There is that play of sovereignty and accountability. Jacob and Esau. We're going to talk more in depth about that here soon. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 23. This is what that says. This is where Peter is talking, um, preaching right after the, the uh, Pen Pentecost. And he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you selves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified. Responsibility. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. Earlier out of these things. Another area we see these, sorry, 
is in uh, John chapter 6. This is what John chapter 6 says. I should have marked this, and I didn't. John chapter 6, starting in verse 35. It says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Responsibility. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. That's the sovereignty. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, sovereignty. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. That is sovereignty and accountability. And the last instance that we're actually going to dive into, as you probably guessed it, in Romans 9 and 10. As we go through these things, you'll find that sovereignty and responsibility, God's, God's election and our, our accountability for his decision, they go hand in hand. And I love how David Platt once mentioned this in his secret church um, message where he said, he shared once that he doesn't know how to uh, rectify God's sovereignty and our accountability. He doesn't know how to rectify the two. But he said, the thing is that he doesn't need to know how because they're not enemies with each other. They're not against each other. Friends don't have to be rectified. We are friends. Sovereignty and election are not opposing views. They're not a paradox. It is God's working, and we may not understand it, but that does not mean that it's an evil doctrine, and it certainly doesn't mean that you can ignore it, because it's, it's not something that you can ignore. It is right there all throughout Scripture. In fact, even on Thursday, when we just went over James chapter 1, we could still see the difference of God's sovereign election and our accountability on the two of them. So Romans 9 and 10. This is, this is the bulk of our message where we're starting at. Paul begins with saying, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. The Israelites have been responsible for all of these things. They're God's chosen people. They've been responsible for all of these. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, meaning God, Jesus, was an Israelite, is the Christ, who is God over all, Blessed and forever. Amen. Verse 6, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. And this is where things get interesting. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Israelites believed that salvation was for the Jewish people alone, that they were God's chosen people, and that they were the descendants of Abraham, they were the ones that had the relationship with God, and that this is like their faith, their religion. But they said, not everybody born in Israel belongs to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. You are not born in to salvation because you're in your pack. You're not born into heaven because you're white or you're African American or whatever race you are. It does not matter what your race is. It does not matter where you're from. It does not matter your history, your past, your whatever. It, you cannot be born into the kingdom because of any qualifying factor. You just cannot. 
So this means it is not children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Those who are in Christ are the ones who are the children of God. For this is what the promise has said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son, and not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, and this is something we want to listen to, and though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, listen to this, he's, a, he's going to talk about Jacob and Esau, and he's saying before they were born, before they had an opportunity to descend, before their characters were even developed, before any of these things, before they had the opportunity to do good or bad or to show promise or a lack of promise, before any qualifying factor, before anything, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls God's sovereignty. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Before they were born, and they even had a chance to be anything at all, God in his sovereign election looked down upon them and elected one as Esau, the one that would be, be kind of the outcast, the one that would be be a vessel of destruction, and he looked at Jacob, and he saw Jacob as the one that would be a vessel for honor and a vessel for glory. And yet, this was 100% totally God's will, God's design, God's sovereignty for salvation and election between the two of these, and yet Jacob and Esau were both individually responsible and held accountable for their own actions and their own choices in this sovereignty. And I know, I know what you're thinking. I think I know what you're thinking. And that is, this is messed up. Why would God commit somebody to be a vessel of dishonor and a vessel of honor? Doesn't that seem wrong? Doesn't that seem not just? Because we know that God is just. We know that God, in his ultimate mercy and compassion, he's a just guy. So this can't be right. We've got to be misunderstanding this. Well, you're not alone. Because verse 14 asks this exact question. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And Paul says, by no means. Now, I want you guys to understand when he says by no means, this isn't Paul just, just answering his own question. The way that this is worded back in the original language is not just like Paul answering his own question, but is actually a form of repentance. This is Paul not just saying no, or by no means, this is Paul actually trying to repent and recant even the thought that God would act in this kind of way. So Paul is, is saying, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, don't even think it. This is wrong. This is sinful. This is absolutely, absolutely not in the character and nature of God because God is not unjust, right? So by no means. He says to Moses, remember this, just last week or the week before that, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion. This is you guys. It does not depend on who you are, what you are, what you've done, what you will do how you're going to live your life, any of these things. There is not one qualifying factor about you whatsoever. There is nothing about you, has nothing to do with you. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on what? But on God who has mercy. As you are saved in Christ, you did not do anything. You were not capable. Think about the great minds in atheism, right? Guys, let's be real. Atheists aren't stupid. There's Dawkins, who is an absolutely brilliant man, right? And an outright atheist, extreme atheist, okay? He's not dumb. 
He's probably smarter than any of us in the room. Let's be honest, okay? I will put myself at the forefront here. I know he's smarter than I am. Do you think that I was able to figure out the scope of the universe and look at everything around me and weigh the options between all of the thousands of religions and think about all of the different holy texts and then through somehow, through my own like doing and my own ability to figure things out, I have found for myself that God is the only true God to the point where I'm willing to admit that there is no other God but God. I'm willing to, 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 to admit that I don't believe that any other God can send you to heaven. I'm willing to admit that God is the only way for salvation and the only way for our sins to, to be forgiven. Do you think there's any way that I could have figured this out? I'm not here to belittle myself. I'm here to kind of put it into perspective. You didn't figure things out. You may have had parents who have taught you things from a young age. But parents teach kids lots of things at a young age that we learn to find out isn't true, right? So that's not much of an argument. Your experiences aren't much of an argument. The only argument that we find in Scripture is that it depends not on human will or exertion, meaning you didn't think about it real hard, you didn't flex your abs and your muscles and, and just work real hard at it. The only person who saved you is God who had mercy on you. Because God has mercy on whom he has mercy and compassion on whom he has compassion.